Hello everybody, can you take a seat if you haven't already? And if you can't hear at the back, there are, there's a whole lovely row of seats empty at the front here if you'd like to uh, move forward. Brilliant, I'll make a start. Um, hello, thank you for coming to this session. My name is Tanya Manning and I'm the Gangs Policy Lead at the Home Office. Um, you've heard in the previous session about county lines and about the scale of the challenge. And I'm sure most of you are already aware of a lot of that. Um, so the purpose of this session is to give you an opportunity to hear from um, a few different perspectives from my lovely panel of experts here and ask um, them questions and we really hope it will be a very interactive session. Um, but before we do that, I'll just do a little uh, overview of the national threat picture and also the national action to tackle county lines from government perspective and also sort of national policing perspective. So um, many of you will be aware that the National Crime Agency have um, so far published two national threat assessments at county lines, one last year and one the year before. Um, and they are due to publish their third one, so their 2017 assessment, um, next week. It's rather annoying, it was meant to be um, published today. Uh, so I was hoping to be able to give you loads of information about it, but I can still give you some top lines. Um, this time they had a 100% uh, response rate from forces, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and the conservative estimate, um, based on the information that the forces provided, is that there are at least 720 county lines running across England and Wales. Um, there's also evidence of lines running into Scotland as well. Um, and 88% of the forces reported county lines activity in their force area. Although we know of those that didn't, other forces um, reported it in those areas. So we are, we are pretty convinced that it is a across the uh, nation issue. Um, so the report, uh, the headlines show that um, obviously county lines groups continue to pose a significant threat to vulnerable uh, people, both young people and adults, um, with uh, sort of three quarters of the forces reporting exploitation of vulnerable people. Um, 77% of forces reporting cuckooing, 61% um, reporting exploitation of drug users, 37% um, of uh, exploiting people with mental health problems. So a very, very <coughs> large issue when it comes to um, exploitation of vulnerable adults. In terms of um, children, 65% uh, of the forces reported exploitation of children, with 26% uh, reporting groups sexually abusing children, um, specifically in terms of county lines. Um, we do believe these are underestimations of um, all the actual facts, but of course um, the report is only based on what police forces provide information-wise. Um, and finally, violence does remain a key feature of county lines activity. Many of you will know this from your own areas. County lines is often accompanied by spikes in violence. Um, and weapons carried um, include you know, knives, firearms, corrosives. Um, and also sexual violence was reported by 21% of forces. So uh, not a particularly pleasant picture. I don't think it'll be a surprise to anybody, but um, good to have it sort of uh, formalised in their new report. So we hope that we published uh, next week, um, and, uh, but we will keep you posted if that, that changes. So in terms of what uh, we as government and others are doing to tackle county lines, um, we've been working since um, about 2014 um, to raise awareness and build uh, capability within policing and with local partners, particularly um, safeguarding partners. Um, we have a, an interministerial group on uh, gangs which is overseeing all this work. Um, and this time last year, they agreed to set up a working group specifically overseeing um, an action plan um, to tackle county lines. And it brings together all the different departments that have um, a role in this, so health, education, DCLG, DWP, MOJ, um, but also the police, National Crime Agency, MOPAC for um, obviously the London element, um, uh, and the CPS. So um, a big, big group of um, organisations that are working together to try and tackle this because, as we all know, it is not a solution that could be fixed by one organisation. Um, so the working group has overseen 12 months of work so far. Um, they are... Um, this has been uh, basically... The act activities have fallen into broadly two categories so far. 
that has been um, about awareness raising and capa uh, capability building. So we've had a lot of awareness raising um, events with key sectors, um, including public health nurses, child safeguarding professionals, social workers, job centre staff, etc. Um, and we have also produced um, a uh, guidance, um, and I've got lots of copies at the front if anyone wants one afterwards, although it is also on the gov.uk website. And it's a guidance for um, any practitioner or anyone working with young people that they think um, might be at risk of exploitation um, through county lines, and it shows them what to look for um, and what to do about it when they identify it. Um, and we also have been funding young people's advocates who particularly work with um, young women and girls who are affected by gangs and county lines gangs. Um, the other um, sort of category of work is very much around law enforcement <coughs> prosecution. Um, so we've been working with the police um, and the NCA on improving cross-border operations, um, both uh, between... Uh, between um, agencies within uh, an area, but also across its um, boundaries as well. Um, the CPS have also issued revised guidance on the use of trafficking legislation um, and modern slavery charges in relation to county lines, and we expect the first cases of those to be going through in the new year. Um, and finally, um, we have introduced new legislation um, to enable the police to close down the deal lines being used by county lines gangs to um, deal their, uh, their drugs in the county lines model. Um, the regulations are currently being debated in Parliament, in fact at this very moment, um, so we are hoping that um, those will be piloted again in the new year. So lots of work is underway, but we very much recognise there is much, much more to be done. And our interministerial group have now given us the steer to move on to that um, phase of work, which is very much about mainstreaming a lot of this activity. Um, so the update action plan <coughs> does build on the findings of the NCA um, report that's due out next week. Um, and the actions fall into uh, sort of four broad themes this time, so a bit much, much broader. Um, so again, uh, law enforcement. So a lot of the work so far has been about sort of um, preparation of, of uh, law enforcement activities. So now it's about implementation and, and taking that forward and mainstreaming it within all areas. So um, this includes obviously the police powers to um, shut down the phone lines and also um, utilising the CPS, um, pro CPS's new prosecution, to, uh, a prosecution approach to county lines. Um, the second strand is around um, national uh, awareness raising. As I said, we've done lots of this already, but we've very much focused so far on statutory partners, um, whereas actually non-statutory partners are just as important. So that is where that is going next. Um, in terms of interventions for our third strand, um, we are working with uh, St. Giles Trust <coughs> and Missing People Organisations to pilot a support service for victims of county lines that's currently <coughs> running between London and Kent um, and we'll be reporting on the uh, evaluation um, in about March next year and then we'll be looking to take that forward. Um, and we're also reviewing the support for victims exploited to transport drugs and money through the National Referring Mechanism system. Uh, and finally, um, evidence gathering and monitoring. Obviously, the National Crime Agency do do these <coughs> annual reports and will continue to do so, but we're also looking at more real-time data sharing and monitoring, um, and that's in the community and also the secure state, just to keep track of um, the issues that are, that are going on in, in the area. So I think that's all from me. That's very much a whistle-stop of what's going on nationally. But I think the key thing today is to hear from uh, my panel here. Um, we have got um, uh, Gwenton Slowly on the end there from Crying Sons, who very much represents the sort of exporting area of a, uh, a county line, um, or county lines, should I say. Um, then we have um, Simon Ford, who is the community safety manager in South End, and have, they have been a very big importing area of county lines. And then we have Claire Hubbardstay, who's the CEO of Safer London, um, and they very much pick up the pieces around county lines in terms of the victims. Um, so if I ask them to all introduce themselves now, say a little bit about their, their perspectives and what they do. Okay. Hi, everyone. 
my name is Gwenton Slowly and I'm a director of Crying Sons Limited and also I work in Lewisham on the serious violence team. And from our view, what we're seeing is a lot of young people that have mostly been excluded from school to turning up on the county lines before it was local drug dealing. And what we have to understand is these were at one time the same young people that were coming to us for gangy issues. So we mustn't confuse the two because what I've seen delivering work across the country where we separate gangs from drug dealing. And until you start looking at the police gangs matrix, which is a database that tracks gang members. And in Lewisham, we've also designed our own matrix called the Savvy Matrix, which we could get sent over to you for you to understand. And the reason why Lewisham decided to create the Savvy Matrix was because what we were seeing was the gangs matrix didn't have the component on there to track drug dealers. It was predominantly set up to track gang members. And when we started analyzing the two matrix, what we found was the gang members were also going outside the counties when they wasn't committing violent crimes locally and committing drug dealing offenses. And without that matrix, the struggle was for the partners on the counties were how do they track the people once they bail them to return? Because a lot of the young people would be on bail in five different counties and no one was tracking how many times they was on bail for drugs or serious incidents. So we decided to do a pilot a few years ago with some of the press, the Home Office and Portsmouth because we had a large number of young people that were missing because that's another trend we're seeing. A lot of the young people that are going missing or absent are turning up on the county lines and until they turn up, they're just invisible young people. And we've also found another trend of a lot of young people that are not entitled to public funds becoming invisible young people and being used as sex workers for the drug dealers. So we would have drug dealers in the house and sex workers as well. So we would have vulnerable young females and young males being used for sex slaves for the people that were dealing the drugs. So what we've decided is to use things like the CBO, the criminal behavior orders, to as an Achilles Hill approach to disable the young people and all the young people traveling to the counties to commit crime. Good, good afternoon. Can you, can you hear me at all at the back? Okay. So, um, good afternoon. I'm Simon Ford. I'm Group Manager, uh, Community Safety at South End Borough Council. I've had a long history of public protection work, both uh, in London in the police and more recently in community safety for local authorities. Um, South End, for those that you don't know, in terms of geography, is a coastal location on the east side of uh, the county of Essex. We're about half hour drive uh, outside of London. Um, I think for me to start, the best way I can probably uh, reflect the current position in South End is just reflect on a rather traumatic incident that happened just a few days ago uh, in the middle of South End. Um, so on uh, Friday morning at half past eight, uh, normal school day, um, a 14-year-old boy was stabbed a number of times uh, in, in a street close to the town centre at half past eight in the morning. He was attacked by two older males, one 19, one 35, uh, white and black. Um, they subsequently ran off. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, our CCTV service captured them running off. Short chase ensued and local police were able to arrest them. They've been remanded in custody. Uh, they are known to uh, the London Trident team. Trident is the London Gangs Unit. Uh, they are gang nominals out of London working in South End. Um, in terms of the 14-year-old boy, he collapsed in the street and fortunately for him, a off-duty paramedic uh, was on site uh, and rushed to his aid. And, um, he was taken into hospital. Um, he was, uh, for a few hours, a uh, life-threatening condition because one of the stab wounds uh, nicked his lung. Um, so for a few hours, it was a bit touch and go, but he's now since stabilized and he's in a safe condition. And police uh, have spoken to him. And from what we know and from the brief conversations we've had with him is that he was uh, picked up and placed in South End um, for three days in a flat. Uh, quite where in South End he doesn't know. 
Uh, he, uh, from what we've established, is a missing person from London. Um, he was stationed in, in this flat for three days, and on the morning, on the Friday morning, he was picked up by uh, these gang nominals, and he was dropped into this street. And this street, incidentally, is a street in Southend that historically is known for county line activity, gangs and groups, for a number of years. He was dropped off in the street shortly after being dropped off, in his own words, to do some form of drug activity work. Um, he was confronted by these two males from another group, another gang, uh, and he was stabbed. When he got to a hospital and the hospital staff started to undress him to treat his wounds, uh, they found a 12-inch kitchen knife strapped to the, uh, the inside of his thigh. Uh, and this is a 14-year-old boy from London. Um, so <clears throat> that's the kind of like situation that uh, we're facing and have been facing in South End. It's not a first instance, it's certainly not going to be the last. I think it reflects in South End currently the increasing violence associated with county line activity, specifically knife crime. Uh, we've seen our knife crime figures in South End double in the last 18 months. And we've seen certainly, and I think this vividly shows, uh, uh, as an example, the increase in exploitation of young kids to do this type of work. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a, it's a case which is you know, really quite shocking, and for me it's quite shocking because I often hear and deal with a lot of these situations, but this one was particularly shocking because I've got a 14-year-old lad and I was trying to compare the two sort of lifestyles. Most 14-year-old girls and boys are challenging, as we know, but my boy is light years away from the lifestyle that this young kid is going through. And I think then we go on to this whole situation of the blurred lines between victim and perpetrator. In my case, in this situation, I would suggest absolutely that this kid is a victim of, this, uh, of the county line scenario. So um, it just gives you a picture, I think, of what's going on in South End. There is lots of work that we're doing in terms of enforcement and disruption. We have up to... 25 lines on any one day working in South End, predominantly from all parts of London, that's east, north, west and south. Um, lots of enforcement, lots of disruption. We're using lots of tools of enforcement, uh, particularly, particularly uh, ASB legislation, so CPNs, CPWs, if you know what they are, community protection warnings, community protection notices and then going on to a, a full CBO, which is a criminal behaviour order. So we're utilising that legislation. We're trying to do that to tackle preparatory behaviours. So we're saying that on these notices that individuals coming into South End, if they're driving a car, they have to be the registered keeper. They're not to have an unregistered phone. They're not to keep certain amounts of cash on their pockets or on person. It's that type of stuff that we're trying to tackle, along with working much more closely now with partners in our housing, our fraud and our benefit services to try and hurt the county line in, in different ways. So that's around in sort of enforcement and disruption. And then on the partnership side, we're doing lots around training and awareness uh, to frontline practitioners. In this particular street where the, uh, this young boy was stabbed, as I said, historically it's associated with gangs and county line activity. Over the last 12 months, we've done a lot of what we call partnership action days where we've had up to 40 partners go into this particular street and offer forms of support services as well as enforcement uh, in terms of being out there and engaging with the residents and the people of this particular street. So there's lots of work there and I can do an entire presentation on, on that particular piece of work that we're doing. It's under the title of Operation Stonegate. Um, so lots of partnership activity, lots of stuff we're trying to do but I think from our point of view at the moment, we are certainly still seeing significant damage being caused by the perpetrators of these, particularly from London. I'll leave it there for the moment. Um, I think <coughs> Simon has alluded to um, already. Um, so, sorry, I'm Claire Hobbesty, Chief Executive at Safe for London. We provide um, <coughs> services um, to young people who are affected um, by violence and vulnerability. Um, part of that, um, includes counter-line um, activity. Um, we also work outside of London, capacity building and sharing expertise and knowledge um, in terms of our models to um, support other local community groups to be able to um, respond themselves and to tackle these sorts of issues. So as I say, I think it's been really well framed um, by some of the conversations that we've started to have um, this afternoon. 
Um, when it comes to county lines, I think there has been, um, it feels like, a, um, some sort of suggestion that it's been overstated or overplayed or that this isn't really an issue. Um, we are talking about really high harm behaviour. As Simon has talked about, and as many of you may well have experienced, we're talking about young people, children, being stabbed and being victims of very, very serious exploitative and damaging behaviour. And this is on a major scale. The 720 lines that are operating out of London that have been identified in the NCA report, how many, of the, how many young people are needed to run those lines? A lot. And what we know about counter lines is the young people involved are really disposable. So they may well only run a line um, or be involved for three weeks and then they're ditched and somebody else is involved. So in terms of the churn of young people, we're talking about a lot and a high volume of them. And we aren't just talking about London young people either. So um, what often happens is that a line's established and then local young people are exploited to continue running that. So if you haven't, in your area, started seeing um, spikes in violence, it's coming. Um, because there is so much money being made by the criminals that are running this that there is a lot of violent interaction to as who gets to control and who gets to benefit financially from this. And that's a massive challenge for all of us. That's a challenge for all of us because of the geography. As soon as a young person moves, we as a system are colossally bad at dealing with that. It's a challenge because you're talking about the intersectionality of lots of different risks. You're talking about missing behaviour, sexual exploitation, sexual violence. You're talking about drugs. You're potentially talking about gangs. How many of us have got different departments and different teams that work on those things? To tackle this, you've got to have a joined up conversation around all of those things, joined up data sets. And we all know that they aren't things that exist at the moment. What's really challenging from a, from a young person's perspective in terms of counted lines is if you don't get that understanding of their risk right, you can make it worse. So the worst cases that we see are, we work with both young women and young men, but the worst cases that we see are young women who get picked up, I'm not going to pick on Essex, um, but in, in an area outside of London, um, and the drugs are taken off them, but it's NFA'd. So, so they don't get bailed, they aren't arrested, they're just kicked back to London. What do we think happens to those young women when they come back without those drugs that they've been coerced to run and without the money either? It massively escalates that risk for them. And if there hasn't been a joined up conversation to say that they've been picked up, they've been um, potentially cautioned, possession with intent to supply, and they're coming back, and nobody knows that's happening, you can't safely risk manage that. You can't safety plan with that young person. And so what we're seeing is huge, huge trauma um, for the young women and, and, and the young men that are involved, not only in terms of what they see when they are in these trap houses, these crack dens, you know, for up to three weeks at a time, but also then the violence that they experience when it all goes wrong or when they get caught. Um, so I think understanding the intersectionality of those risks, and that is a massive challenge for all of us in terms of how we respond to that, but also, going back to some of the earlier conversations, remembering that this is about children, this is about protecting children, and we have to get that message across that yes, there are some people that are gaining and making criminal gains out of this, but the vast majority of those involved in the day-to-day -day elements of it are children that have been exploited for criminal gain. They won't see themselves as victims. That's part of the deal around exploitation. You don't, but that doesn't mean that they aren't. And I think for us, working in the youth space, it's really important that we try to champion that victim element. Because if we aren't holding that and we aren't championing that, then nobody else is either. And I think that's really important in terms of remembering that this needs to be a safeguarding response. Um, I will stop there on my rant. Um, yeah, open that up. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, I think that might immediately lead into a couple of questions. Um, so we'll take questions from the floor in a second, but just to note that we don't have a roving mic because apparently there was too much feedback. So please stand up, say your name nice and clearly, and your question. So who wants to start? Uh, do you want to go first and then the lady? Um, 
I'm Councillor Joe Valuri, I'm from the London Borough of Islington, um, and I'm working with a cross uh, party group of 21 local authorities in London to campaign on county lines uh, issues. Okay? Oh wow, is that really? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a councillor for Islington, uh, and I'm working on county lines stuff with 20 other London boroughs. Uh, and there are a couple of points I wanted to make, um, mostly on, on the stuff that you said is happening next, Tanya. One is on awareness. Um, is there a plan to do some awareness work nationally through the Home Office targeted at parents and young people? Because at the moment, it's the case that even schools and professionals don't know about something like We all know, most people don't know. And the knock-on of that professionals is that the work around missing children and potential serious case abuse isn't happening because it's not recognised in county lines to know what it is. But the general public, parents and young people themselves, no safeguarding work has been done at all, really. So is there any plan to do that? In the <coughs> On uh, data mapping, um, at the moment, the NCA asked the police forces to send back information, which they then publish. But is there any plan for the dynamic uh, approach you mentioned, Tanya, to uh, look at arrest data and, super, uh, and to kind of map it the way that we've done locally in London to uh, actually produce a dynamic map of where people are going. Because if we look at possession of intent to supply arrests outside home authority, you start to build up quite a good map of where your, your young people are. And that's something we've done and something that other viruses are doing. And if we did that and we have the data, then we could actually start to know what the known universe of this is for those who at least get caught. Um, on the national strategy, is there any plan to actually publish something that we can all look at and scrutinise? One of the things that's been positive about CSE in the response is that there was a national action plan published in 2011, uh, updated even on progress. We have a standard way of working, clearly delineated authority and um, responsibilities between authorities. It's not perfect, but it's consistent when it works well. With county lines, is there any plan to publish a national strategy or action plan which we can all read? see whose responsibility it is to do what, and then hold people to account when they're not doing it. Uh, and at the sharp end of that, and I'll sort of finish on this point, if a young person from Islington or another London borough is arrested in Aberdeen, selling drugs to oil ring workers, what should the response be at the moment? What should happen? Uh, because at the moment, what we're seeing is uh, wildly differing responses according to where our young people are arrested. We've had young people who were bail, who were already on bail um, when they were arrested. We have the NFAs, we have young people who are effectively working as slaves because their drugs have been taken and they've been returned to the gangs. Um, we don't know when to refer to the NRM, um, we want guidance on when that should happen, and what we're finding is that young people are getting a, a, a randomly different response from police forces around the country. So what we really need to be part of the action plan when it is published publicly is consistency. So everyone knows what they should be doing and we can be holding to account for that. Okay, thank you. That was quite a lot of questions. Um, that's all right. Um, uh, so, um, on awareness raising um, and looking at um, something national targeted at young people and parents, yes, that will be part of that. Um, getting access to young people is difficult, as many of you will know. Getting access via schools, etc., and other educational institutions can be difficult. Um, but we are working with our comms colleagues to look at other ways to um, get, get access to them. Um, and in terms of parents, there are some really um, interesting projects going on that we have um, uh, funded through our sort of local bid process um, this year that are doing exactly that. So working with parents, foster carers, um, and those others uh, around those young people that currently are not even aware of these as issues. Um, those uh, projects we will, um, will be coming to an end at the end of the financial year and we will be looking at how the lessons can be learned from those and we can um, potentially roll those out further. Uh, on data mapping, yes, absolutely. We are looking at all different elements of um, data that exist and how they can be combined um, to produce something more real time and more um, substantial. Um, and we are particularly working with uh, London, the, the Met and um, others and the National Policing Lead on how we can um, make that work on a national level because it's a lot more difficult than, than just focusing on London. Um, plans to publish a national strategy on county lines, um, not at this very moment in time, just because 
this relies on a uh, cross-government response, and some departments are less willing to prioritise it than others at the moment, and that is an ongoing process. The minute we have, um, you know, something that that we can set out uh, clearly, then we will publish something. Um, but at the moment, we're very much more let's just get on with it rather than publish something specifically. Um, having said that, if you have feedback on the approach so far, please do provide it. Um, and in terms of what should the response be, um, yes, agree, it's very different across, across areas and particularly where, with county lines where young people are picked up in a completely different area. Um, the guidance that I referred to here um, includes what, what could be done, but the, that is part of looking at the consistent response in, in, the, in the new action plan. So, yes, basically all that is in train, but, but not done yet. So thank you for raising. Okay, uh, should we take a couple of questions now? Oh, sorry, you, you were going to go next, weren't you? Oh, lovely. Uh, should we take a couple of questions and then um, we can take them at the same time? So. Uh, at, the, at the back there? Well, uh, do you want to take a couple of questions? Uh, yeah, sure. is there, has anyone got a question that's sort of along those lines? No, let's just take that one then. Yeah, so in South End, we've been using antisocial behaviour legislation for the last sort of 18 months or so. Another site that uses ASB legislation across the UK is Liverpool. So we've been working closely with Liverpool on some of this as well. Um, we've been concentrating that work on adults rather than the kids. The kids we're trying to get into safeguarding and distract rather than punish them. So it's mainly uh, associated with London nominals coming in, as I said, in vehicles, hire cars, mobile cars. So some of the conditions that we put on the CPNs and CPWs and then later to a CBO are things like uh, to be the registered keeper of the vehicle, not to have certain amounts of cash on you when you come into South End, those type of restrictions. And we're having some success with that because it's, it's getting in their faces is what we're trying to do rather than the full on arrest uh, and, 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 the, and the complete demand of taking out an entire line. We're trying to do it piece by piece. So the ASB legislation certainly gets up their noses and it's, and it's trying to tackle that preparatory behaviour that they undertake before they get to South End. They do come back. Uh, one thing I will mention in terms of South End and across the UK on this sort of work is that the lines are very adaptable, very flexible and very dynamic. And they always seem to be one step ahead in terms of the criminal justice sector. So as soon as we're onto them and start to put things like these conditions into CPNs and CPWs, they will change their behaviour and they will change their tactics very quickly. One example of that in South End that we're seeing recently is that we put a lot of conditions around the amount of cash on a person in a vehicle coming into South End. And the way round that in terms of the, the, the nominals coming in is that they'll go to a betting shop first and they'll get a betting winning slip to say that they went into the betting shop and got the £200 cash that way first. So they're constantly changing their tactics and their behaviour to, to, to keep and sustain the line open because as Tanya said and Claire said, these lines are incredibly incredibly lucrative and why would a kid of 14 15 16 17 coming out of school take on a 50 pound a day plumbing course hairdressers course when potentially they can be attracted by two or three hundred pound a day to go into south end from newham great uh any more questions please Oh, do you want to just ask your question as well, and then I'll, we can yeah. ask them? Thank you. 
Um, so uh, if I take the modern slavery legislation question quickly. Um, so this is something that is um, currently being, um, there's a couple, I think there's three cases that are due to come to the court uh, in January. Um, and it is absolutely very much about making sure that we are targeting and prosecuting the right people and not the people that are being exploited. Um, so it, uh, it remains to be seen what happens in those cases, obviously. We are very hopeful um, and we hope that that will start to change the, the way that courts particularly look at this. Um, as I said, the CPS have um, issued revised guidance on this for their prosecutors, um, but ultimately <coughs> it will be down to um, what happens in those test cases, basically. Yeah, I think we're really, really hopeful from a victim's perspective that if we get these cases over the line, um, that we might get a sort of sea change in terms of the, the use of young people around this. Um, because if there's, if there's a successful prosecution, it affects the sentencing, it affects the wing that they go on in prison, it affects what they're convicted under, all of which will be perceived very, very differently if you're convicted as a gang master exploiting children than if you're running drugs. Um, and, and that in and of itself may well act as enough of a deterrent to, to well, no doubt change the, the, me the mode and method, um, so it won't necessarily prevent this, but it could well be um, a useful um, tool. Um, but also the successful prosecution would send a signal that actually around the victim element that young people need to be seen as victims and that there are criminals exploiting this, and that's a really important message, I think, on a national basis. Um, and that's exactly what um, Nazir um, managed to do in Rochdale um, using a similar piece of legislation around the CSE stuff at the very beginning. And I think if we were able to get that sort, same sort of momentum and that um, yeah, high profile cases convicted, I think um, it might really help get some traction around this. Um, fingers crossed, they keep getting delayed. So. Yeah, for, for me, what I'd like to add to that is about missing. So a lot of schools and parents need to understand when to report a young person missing and the only time to report a young person missing is immediately. Because unless you report them missing immediately, we're not going to know where they are. They become invisible. And I, I keep repeating that term, invisible young people in ungoverned spaces. Yeah, Because there's no laws. They, they abide by total different laws when they're at their drug dealing. And we must not misunderstand the market and the drug scene. Not every young person out there is being forced or pressurized into drug dealing. Some of them find it an attractive way of life. And after today, I want you to think of drug dealing, county line drug dealing, as an agency. So if we start thinking of little pockets of agencies across the country, we will get a better understanding of what we're dealing with. If we just sit and think, oh, it's drug dealing, it's all horrible and it's all wrong, we're going to be forgetting the attractive part of the actual event that is happening. And the event that's happening is we've got an agency, we've got a CEO, we've got a supervisor, we've got people that do different things, we've got an enforcer. So if, if I'm running an agency in South End and someone else is ready down there, I need to be more dangerous than the agency that was there before me. Because then my agency workers will go and work for Agency X because they're making 10,000 pound a week comfortably and they're more dangerous. So if we start getting that into our head and looking at them as professionals, then we will understand that these young people and older young people, that and the reason why I use the term older young people, because a lot of them have been put in prison and their lives have been preserved, but they're still coming out at the age that they went into prison. They've just been preserved. So we've got a lot of young people and older young people across the country that are thinking of themselves as entrepreneurs. Meanwhile, the rest of the country look at them as drug dealers. If someone's making £10,000 a week on one line and they've got four lines in one area, not a lot of us in this room are making £4,000 a week after tax. So we have to look at that and say for a young person that's been promised £500 a week, a lot of them won't make it through the week without getting robbed first. Because the minute they get robbed, they then become indebted for the rest of the year to the person that sent them to deliver this package. So a lot of the young people that are in school, their family are probably finding it hard 
with all these new financial changes. So the young person thinks, you know what, all I have to do is get on a straight train, because a lot of these trains are straight, they're not changing anywhere, and they're hiding in toilets, a lot of them not being able to buy train tickets, and that's how they're being caught. And all they have to do is drop some drugs off and they might get £500 the first week. They're definitely going back the next week. But where is that young person meant to be within that time that they're transporting that drugs? And I think that is the bit that we're missing here. Most of these young people are meant to be in some form of education training, but they're not. So we need to have that conversation again. Why is it that you're not reporting the young people absent or missing? Why are we waiting to find them on a the county line or for a mum to, to be on social media pleading for her son to return home? And only then we have professionals raising concerns because a mum's gone on social media and raised it. So we need to understand and reinforce that message of immediately reporting young people when they go missing. If I just answer the uh, question around the cars, it doesn't surprise me at all in terms of, uh, as I said, they're changing methods of offence and their tactics. I think you've, you, you may have read the increasing uh, use of scooters in London at the moment. Scooter-based crime is going through the roof, so that doesn't surprise me in terms of theft of motor vehicle. What we do know is that uh, one, in terms of vehicles, previously in terms of running lines, they would use higher cars to come in and to transport uh, their drugs and do their deals. Uh, and we're seeing that move to now lease cars. And the same as accommodation, whereas before uh, they've gone to a site and cocooned a site, a vulnerable person, uh, a social housing site, um, they're moving because we've got onto that and we've started to use antisocial behaviour legislation to close those sites, close your orders, that sort of thing, working with housing partners. They're now onto that and now they're moving into things like short-term lets for just a two or three days and even Airbnb places to set up a closed market site to then operate uh, the deals from that site for just two or three days, then shutting down and moving away. <clears throat> Is that something you've seen a trend in in your area then? Theft of cars. Yeah. Millennium. That that comes back down to what I said about different strands of county lines and local drug dealing. Because we mustn't get confused with only county lines. There's some areas within London that you make more money than any county line. So we've got local county lines and it's just to understand what drugs market you're dealing with. And a lot of the time those cars are being stolen for enforcement. And they might be used across the country to go and enforce some sort of pressure on someone else. I think it's less used for transporting because if you're thinking about it, would you be moving kilos or ounces of drugs in a stolen car? You wouldn't be moving that in there. You'd be very desperate. But if you're going to do some reinforcement, you don't care about that car. So you'd rather take that car because it's disposable. So you will drive that car up there do whatever you need to do in that area. Leave the car and get the train back. So I think it's the cars are more stolen and set set away somewhere quietly until you might need to go somewhere across the country to flex your muscles. So the cars are more for reinforcement than transporting and moving around humans instead. It was more about moving around weapons in the cars. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Everyone's gone quiet on us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a conversation we could have after the meeting. But we've had a lot of young people in Somerset, a large amount of young people. We've had to speak with the housing providers down there. 
because a lot of people thought because it was a small area that you wouldn't have the level of county line drug dealing. But yeah, we had a large amount of young people that we've had to deal with going down there because the drugs market was amazing down there for the young people that were drug dealing. So that's a conversation we could have off the table because it's about understanding drug dealing yourself and then being able to break that down to the young person to show them that the odds of you working in a small shop to you making millions of dealing drugs is very slim. And for the professionals to understand that, to be able to break it down. Same thing with the parents, carers, or whoever is in charge or looking after that young person, to have the knowledge themselves to break it down. Because if you don't have the knowledge, you wouldn't be able to explain something. And that's why I said, if you think of it as an agency, and then the people at the bottom are disposable, they're the workers, then you then be able to explain to that young person, look, I go to work and there's someone down there that nobody cares about and that will be you and you'll end up in prison. So it's about understanding it better yourself as a professional than to be able to pass the message on. I think it I, I agree, I, it, it's not, and there are lots of young people who are willing to talk. Um, I don't know whether you heard the, the presentations that immediately before we broke out into these groups, but the University of Bedfordshire, in terms of the adolescent risk piece, have done some um, work with lots of voluntary sector organisations that work in this space, looking at key principles. I think Lucy did actually refer to them, but basically, um, looking at what the core elements are that you need from service provision so advocacy children's rights based that they're independent and um, that they come from um, a place um, wh which starts where the young person is that the solution focus so I think there's some useful work in terms of engaging with very high risk young people in the adolescent age group um, which would include young people affected by counting lines that I think is really useful um, and if you can look at how that overlays into your um, into your practice um, I appreciate it's much more difficult when you're a statutory agency um, just the very fact that we're a voluntary sector organisation and young people choose to engage with us is often the thing that makes a fundamental difference um, you know we're offering long-term one-to-one intensive support which I'm sure is what many of you um, provide as well it's, it's that we're there it's that we're consistent it's that we're listening it's that we do assertive outreach and we go to young people where they need us and when they need us um, we aren't sort of nine to five and, and those are the things that, that allow young people to choose to engage with us and work with us um, that isn't always easy if you're a statutory provider, but, but I think there is some useful stuff from, from the adolescent risk um, and contextual safeguarding stuff um, that you might find helpful. Um, my name is Linda Lynn, and I'm the chair of the Youth Courts Committee and Magistrate City at Highbury Corner. <coughs> Excuse me, so covering North London, we have a lot of uh, county line activity for my young people. Um, one is to tell you about something that's been happening recently, and the other one is possibly a provocative question to people. Um, <clears throat> but number one is very much recently, if the youth offending teams have told the Crown Prosecution Service that they have some evidence of exploitation, we have started to see CPS requesting three-week adjournments to look at that, and then they won't be pressing charges. They won't be placing alternative charges they just won't be pressing charges. And that's something that's just been trickling through in the last three or four months. The provocative question is about sentencing. I feel very outnumbered. <laughs> How about the only sentencer here? Um, is, does sentencing make any difference? Because I've been sitting in youth court for 15 years. I don't look here, obviously. Um, and, you know, a lot of kids come and they go, and when you send 17 year olds into custody for intense supply, they are really surprised because they were told they'd just get a tag. And also, you're taking the principles of sentencing in respect of youths and individuals. But I, it's a, just a broad question. Does anybody have a view about whether sentencing has any impact? Uh, as a deterrent or anything else? 
I, I think that's a really good point that you raise because the reason why young people, the younger they are, more attractive is exactly that reason. Because a lot of people that are targeting these young people, they're thinking nothing's going to happen to you. So don't worry about it. You'll get a slap on the wrist or just say someone, an invisible person, forced you to do it. So what you just said there is exactly the reason why we're seeing a lot of these young people becoming attractive to older drug dealers and their peers. Because that's another thing we need to understand, that we've got a lot of peer-on-peer -peer stuff happening here where someone will introduce their friend the same, same age as them into drug dealing. So it's not always the stereotypical thing we hear of older people pressuring young people into dealing. We've got a lot of peer-on-peer -peer happening. So you have two young people or five of them from the same school, same year, going missing, but one of them is the boss of the other four. And then everyone would think, oh, where's this older person? But what has happened is the first person that's gone down there has worked for someone else and run off with a phone line and now brought his friends. And until he is then stabbed or something happens to him, only then we will find out that he tried to set up his own agency and start drug dealing for himself. Did either of you want to add anything on that? No. Um, just uh, quickly, I know uh, the Ministry of Justice have been doing some work on um, uh, the effect of uh, sentence, different sentences as deterrents, and they were particularly looking at um, knife crime, because obviously the, the legislation about mandatory minimum sentences. Um, and they, I believe they're due to, um, they're working through the findings of that at the moment, but they were specifically working with young people to find out what kind of effect knowing what kind of sentence you might get would make. Um, and in fact, whether it made any difference whatsoever. So, I apologise. <laughs> My name is Bume. I, I work with uh, traumatised young people, and that's a big issue that we see in the young people that we see. Because, and I'm not giving anybody any information around trauma that you don't know. Trauma is built on fear, shame, and the sense of injustice. If I'm a 17 year old, that's carrying a knife because I think I'm going to trade and I need to protect myself. And then you're sentencing me for it. You're only making it worse. And that's, what's, what, that's what partly drives that notion of there is no difference that sentencing mm. makes. It doesn't make it because the, the, the logic line that they're following isn't, this is going to affect my life this way. It's I need to survive. So that's, that's what I find difficult. And there's always the question of what do we do with children. So I do apologize for jumping in there, but I, I couldn't let that go. Sorry. No, no, I, c I completely understand that. Um, and it's about what, um, what risk are they prepared to take when they, that is the sentence they may get. So whether it is, when you're thinking about knife crime, whether it's, well, actually, I don't care what the risks are because I want to protect myself, and that's certainly their perception. Um, or when it comes to county lines, is it down to the money? You know, I don't care if that's the sentence because actually the gains that I think I'm going to get outweigh that. So or the risk that's being faced. Yeah. So, so a sentence versus the level of coercion or threat mm. I'm at risk of, and, and that's the other thing. And that's, that is why it's so important to do the information sharing piece and understand that risk element around each individual case on this, because Gwenton's absolutely right. You've got some young people who, um, you know, there isn't necessarily the level of coercion and threat, where you've got other young people where um, they are massively um, coerced into it, and and you have to make um, a judgment call at times, but you have to do um, an informed needs assessment to understand that picture, um, and that's what's so challenging at the moment because we're missing so many pieces of the information to be able to do that in an informed way. But what is happening in lieu of that process? is that all of them are being treated as criminals. Um, so there's no balance here whatsoever at the moment. So, so we aren't able to filter out young people who, who we think are um, making substantial criminal gain from this and who maybe have made an active choice, although I would still question their yeah. sort of historical um, victim status, um, as, as you would probably expect me to say. Um, but there's no balance because we are not seeing the number of young people being treated as victims as well. Um, and, and that's just not happening. So at the moment, I think we're only looking at the enforcement side because it's the visible, tangible thing that we can hang you know, stuff on. 
um, and you've got lots of political will. So in police and crime commissioners, for example, have set targets around the number of drugs arrests. You know, um, we, we want to see drugs arrests go up. We want to see active enforcement around our, our drugs market, which means that more young people are being criminalised as a result of that particular focus. And that's been done in isolation without a joined up approach. So I would echo the calls around a national strategy um, for this because I think what you're doing is, is tackling something over there but in isolation of the bigger picture and um, which actually escalates risk for lots of young people. Um, we need to be looking at this as a public health issue um, because where is all the activity around the resident drug markets that's driving this? We're not seeing that. We just are not seeing public health take a lead in terms of disrupting the markets that are the drivers for the line <coughs> going in in the first place and, and that for me has to be um, the other element that we're looking at if we're going to really tackle this and that just doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. to do piloted it without funding I'm not going to say what bar it was but yeah we have to do it with funds that we got from elsewhere is have a evening a week where we had the parents come in and we went through CSE county lines all that break it down to the parents online because we get a lot of young people being contacted via social media to deal drugs so it's a total different medium they're now being pressured on because you look attractive you look like you could be a drug dealer and for the schools the struggle is some schools would want you to come in there to deliver county line stuff or gang stuff but call it something else call it anything else but what it really is because we don't want a negative energy getting into the young people, as you said, that are not quite there yet in case they then become attractive because you've come in there to put prevention. So it's for the schools to say, look, we will rather the prevention than having to deal with cleaning up the mess after because we've had a lot of schools where we've had murders, young people being chopped with machetes and everything else. And this is the same school that we've gone in, offered services, offered to do drop-in surgeries with the school, but the head teacher's in denial, or if they're academy, they think they're outside of the rules because they've got CEOs and head teachers at the same time. So it's about the school's understanding, yes, we've got a problem, or we haven't got a problem, but we want to put some prevention in place. And I think that should be across the board because we, we then have a lot of schools that wait for the problem to hit their doorstep then they ask for the solution. But it's about a blanket approach where everybody gets it. The same thing with the community trauma, as he was just explaining just now. It's not about, okay, we'll give it to you when there's a problem. There's been a problem, we need to stop denying it and offer the support. So for the schools, I think the schools just need to come to terms and especially where you are, is prime target for all of this stuff because you're on the cusp of all of it as well. So. The schools just need to come to term and say, you know what, could you come in? And we're not only talking secondary school, because that's something else that a lot of people get confused. From year five, year six, we've got young people that are outside and they're in training already. For the time that they hit secondary school, they're ready to go. You're finding 11 year olds, 12 year olds on county line. So I think it needs to start from like year five, year six. Empowering parents. Yeah. So 
And not, not, not just the schools as well. I think housing providers have got a massive part to play. And I think the housing providers should send it out with their newsletter that they're actually delivering this training because not just antisocial behaviour because it will turn into something else depending on where you live. So I think we need to hold housing providers to account as well because a lot of it starts there. So even if the school doesn't accept that they've got a problem or they want help, we should have the housing providers sign up to be a part of this because a lot of vulnerable people are being targeted. And I keep using the word invisible because until they come visible, they're invisible people suffering in silence. And there's hundreds of them across the country, as we're speaking now, that are suffering and wish that someone could make them visible so they could get the support. And there's a question down here somewhere. There's a hand. Yeah. Just, um, just to sort of highlight, when you talked about um, at the moment, it seems that a lot of these children that are found to be involved in gangs and to be involved in, in drugs are being criminalised, that actually we need to get a lot cleverer and forces and children services that are first responders able to refer into the NRN. Because every child that we believe has been trafficked or exploitation, and one of them being criminal, <laughs> I'm hearing that loud and clear. I will, I will take, because I'm not the actual lead on, on that plan, so I will definitely take that back and um, see if we can push forward on getting something published there on are that. There are some processes already in place for children's services yeah. based on the NRN. It's just about making sure there's that, that awareness raising, because this is still very new. Yeah. It's really, really developing. You know, I'm from Surrey Police, so quite a small county force, and really now just really starting to see, or we see a real issue in force with gangs that think that they can hide in the counties that come in from the cities and think they can hide in the county forces. And now we're starting to do some training and awareness raising. I just know it's going to get bigger and bigger because it's a hidden crime like all this exploitation. It's all hidden crime. And until you start doing that training, awareness raising, and consciousness talking about it, it's going to get bigger and bigger. So we what? need that action plan to ensure that processes are in place. But we, we come back down to the point that we just raised with the schools. Last year, I delivered training to just under a 1,000 frontline Met officers across the city, and that was a part of the mass training, gangs and mental health. And when I went to places like Sutton, Bromley, and certain other places, they were like, we haven't got a problem here. But this year, they've contacted me and say, the problem's reached us. Could you come back and... so?" Until it hits the doorstep, a lot of people are in denial that, oh, it's happening just up the road. Yeah. And I think also just uh, in defence of the uh, Home Office, the Home Office run every quarter something called the EGVE Forum uh, and basically invite lots, many, many boroughs and localities from across the UK to that forum event in London. And most, in fact, all of those boroughs and localities have experienced county line activities. So they're normally gangs leads, community safety managers. Some are like yourselves, they're youth offending leads. So they come to that site every quarter and we discuss this, this 
best practice stuff that's going on across the country. Uh, and one of the things that Fiona, who works with the Home Office, who's the lead, the national lead on county lines, uh, Tanya spoke about the county line, national county line working group. And in fact, last week we had an EG forum where all those in the room were contributing to the development of a new action plan under that county line national group. So things that you're suggesting there were all fed back from the audience as we're doing now. On your uh, national referral mechanism um, question, um, that is one of the things that the national policing lead is taking forward as an action um, to look at that across the country. Um, a lot, uh, you know, with with that work. So, yes, we are aware of that. Oh gosh, got lots of fingers. Oh, there what was over there first? Yep. No. No. It's <laughs> It's all over the country. We've got people from Newcastle on the same line as people from East London. So it's wherever the market is lucrative. It doesn't matter where you're from. And they'll travel hundreds of miles. So Liverpool county line groups will come down to Bournemouth and the south coast. Cardiff and Swansea will go across to Norfolk and Suffolk. London will go anywhere across the UK. And Midland gangs will largely come down to the southwest, so Devon and Cornwall. Hands disappeared. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Uh, two weeks ago, we done some training at the Ministry of Justice to the people that write the policies down there because the prison estate is a large part of this puzzle because it gives a lot of criminal gang members inside and other criminals access to the rest of the country once they're inside the prison. So I think it's a part that we need to look at. A lot of people exclude that from the puzzle when we're dealing with this problem, but it's a crucial part because a lot of people only get access to the rest of the country when they are put in prison. Um, yeah, and the, the Ministry of Justice are also, we are pushing them on that through the interministerial group um, to do more on, on exactly that. Uh, there, was, there was a hand somewhere, yes, yeah, that's it. Yeah, just a point really. Um, I've heard some fantastic discussions today about children being victims and we have met in Hampshire and going out every year. We get that. However, in the last week, while I'm a bit confused by Chrissy de Vitt saying, actually, uh, more teenagers need to have touch lenses. <laughs> basically um, okay I think are we out of time now yeah um, would just was there anything final that any of you wanted to say that we haven't picked up so far thank you very much everyone it's been really interesting brilliant uh, I've just got one tiny final thing if anybody um, so one of the Simon with his other hat on um, delivers local area reviews um, for us match funded by the Home Office so if anybody um, in their area thinks their area would benefit from a uh, local review which looks at all the issues talks to all the different partners and sees how um, producers recommendations for response then please do let either Simon or I know thank you